you missed any of these teachings, you can go to YouTube, shout Chill First Assembly of God, and you'll find them under the playlist Wednesday night, or actually the playlist, uh, the Seven Churches of Revelations. So you'll have all the teachings there uh, from the introduction all the way till tonight. I'll upload this tonight and get it up there for you. Um, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. And tonight we're going to be talking about the seventh and last church that is mentioned directly um, in context to the seven churches here in the first, in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we're going to be talking about uh, the church at Laodicea. The church at Laodicea. Now, as we, as we look at this church, as we see... Uh, it, it, it's a church that many theologians believe represents our modern church today. So what we have here is in Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 through 22. Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 through 32. Here real quick, here we go. And to the angel of the church of, La of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of, cre of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Verse 19. And I need to pass on to the next one here. I'm sorry about that. I don't have my clicker with me tonight. Here we go. Verse 19 at the very bottom. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What we have going on here in this particular passage, uh, we'll look beginning first with a little bit of a historical perspective so that you can see uh, a little bit of the situation here. Laodicea is 100 miles east of Ephesus. You can see the difference here. And then about 100 miles plus southeast of Pergamos all the way down here. Now the interesting thing, from Pergamos and Laodicea, there is a highway that connects all five of those cities. And there's a highway between Ephesus and Laodicea. So Laodicea becomes a crossroads between, in, in the uh, province of, of, uh, of Asia Minor at that time. And we see that uh, these churches were chosen, churches obviously, Ephesus planted by Paul, and then the evangelism that went out into the region and these churches were planted by people who either heard the gospel in Ephesus or uh, ministers went to these cities and they began to preach the gospel and the gospel was planted. So we have the two uh, major highways today in the city. Let me, uh, I'm just thinking here, I'm tall and if you're sitting down, I'm in your way. Today the city is called Eski Hisar. Now, I don't know if I pronounced that properly, but uh, that's uh, a modern day city in Turkey. And so you have this here. She was founded in 250 BC by the Seleucid Antichus II. And the city was named in honor of his wife, Laodicea. And so, or Laodice, Leo, however you want to pronounce the name. So the city was founded by Antichus II, and then he named it after his wife. Then we have, let's see here. I'm sorry, forget the top there. See, I go and copy and paste and take out. I forgot to take out last week's. 
the second one, the city was taken over by the Romans in 1930 or 133 BC, and like Philadelphia, the city also suffered from earthquakes that necessitated rebuilding. Necessitated rebuilding. Okay, so forget that stuff. Forgot to erase that on top. And as you look at some of the, the ruin, the pictures of the ruins, you see that the columns are falling down. Now, it could be age, but the area, and we can say that whole area in Turkey, is under a seismic, uh, earth shaking plate. Because you remember, we talked about the other cities, like Philadelphia, had earthquakes and that the city had suffered. We talked about how Christ had promised that he would be their source of stability, the rock upon which they could, they could build their lives that would not shake last week. Now, in this situation, in the historical perspective, the citizens of Laodicea, on two different occasions, in 17 AD, the same earthquake that, that devastated Philadelphia. And then in 60 AD, they rebuilt the city all by themselves. They refused the help of the Roman Caesar. They said, no, we don't need it. They could do it on their own. The city itself was populated by both Jews and Syrians, those who had been transplanted from other parts of, uh, of the previous empires, the Babylonian Empire and all that who came in and settled in this area. The city uh, uh, well the four elements that brought renown to Laodicea was for banks and wealth. A very wealthy city. Now it's interesting that they had a large community of Jews. And the Jews even to our day are very good in business. Extremely good in business. And it's no shock to me that they were uh, probably some of the bankers in Laodicea. Her school of medicine, which focused on uh, ophthalmology, and her pharmaceutical discoveries, ear ointment and eye drops were something that were known and exported to other parts of uh, the Roman Empire. She was also known for her black wool industry. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen with my eyes, and if I have, I haven't forgotten, a black sheep. We hear that used in a derogatory sense, I'm a black sheep of the type of thing. But in this particular situation, this wool was coveted by people throughout the empire. They wanted to have this. They would do it in such a way, they would prepare it in such a way that it was extremely soft and extremely comfortable when they would make the clothing from the wool itself. And so this was something that was uh, part of the industry there. And then there was her entertainment. Now, this is a picture of one of their theaters that's in ruin. It's interesting, they had, they had a matinee theater in the morning and they had an evening, uh, an evening theater. So, one was pointing towards where the sun was hitting the stage uh, in the morning, and then at night, before dusk, the sun was hitting the stage. So they had two different theaters where people could go to a, a show, as it were, in the morning, and go to one in the evening if they wanted to. So it was, an, it was a city that was also uh, enjoyed uh, their entertainment. There was no source of water in Laodicea. They built a stone aqueduct, and I've had a chance to see a Roman aqueduct in the southern part of France, and it's amazing after 2,000 years it's still standing. Obviously it's not functioning like it did when it was built. But they built a stone aqueduct three and a half miles long uh, to bring thermal hot water from Heropolis, and they also brought in cold water from Colas and mixed that, that mixed it with the, the hot water, thus making it tepid or lukewarm. And there was a middle, there was a big basin in the middle of the city of Laodicea where this water would go. And the water was filled with a lot of different things, uh, minerals and things of that nature that they would obviously have to filter out the best they could. And some of it, they actually, the calcium that was contained in there had other types of minerals that when dried out and turned into a powder would, is what the materials they used to make the eye drops that helped to heal the eyes from whatever ailment they had. 
And so it's quite interesting as you're, as you're looking at this here. The setting, in this particular passage, Jesus is described as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. You see, the people in Laodicea were self-sufficient. They didn't need anybody. They didn't need the Romans. And the one could get the attitude that they didn't even need God. They were self-sufficient. But Jesus describes himself as the amen. So be it. The faithful and true witness. What I am going to share with you right now, Jesus is saying, is coming from the truth. Because I'm a faithful and true witness. And then the beginning of the creation of God. It's interesting that in John, John, who wrote Apocalypse, or excuse me, the Revelations, Apocalypse is the French word for it, who wrote Revelations, also wrote the Gospel of John, which said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then we jump, drop down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, talking of Jesus Christ. So the beginning of the creation of God, He was there when God spoke the word, words, worlds into existence and the universe into existence. The Word in the beginning, the Word. In Isaiah, hold on, hold on. we go back here. That was last week's. There we go. The message of the church at Laodicea, the condition of the church. First of all, they were lukewarm. They were lukewarm. Verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot, so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or, nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's interesting that sometimes, if you're really, really thirsty, like for instance, I'll leave a jug of water or water bottles in the back of my truck, and if I keep that window closed and the sun beating down on that truck, I open up that water bottle, and I'll drink it, but I sure don't want to. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not hot, boiling hot, it's lukewarm, and you start chugging it down, and if you're looking for something refreshing, it will quell, it will quell the thirst momentarily, but it doesn't bring the type of refreshing that you're looking for. And so in this particular situation, I'm free out rather that you be cold or hot, but you're neither. You're lukewarm. Now remember, water came from Kulas, that was cold, water from Meropolis that was hot, thermal, thermal water, and when they came together and mixed, that created lukewarm water. So they had to find some other means to maybe uh, shift some of the water from Kolas off to like maybe a, a, a pool for drinking water and the other for, for thermals. We know that in this whole part of Asia, the Romans were really, really big, and the Greeks as well, really, really big in thermal, uh, thermal uh, medical places where they use thermal hot water to help people heal from arthritis, from other type of joint ailments. We have, have a friend that's still alive in, in France, and she would go once a year for treatment, and they would take the waters from these thermals, and she would either soak in them or they would spray her with them. Uh, and it wasn't just a little tiny water pressure, it was huge water pressure in order to, I don't know what they did, but apparently it helped her. And so in that situation here, the church was lukewarm. Now, being a lukewarm church, uh, why is he saying this? Why is Jesus saying this to the church at Laodicea, to the believers at Laodicea? I think we can gather the, the, this saying that, they're, that they were at one time hot with spiritual fervor. And their lives lived in such a way to be refreshing to those who were seeking truth around them. We don't know what happened, but we can guess they became like the water in their town, lukewarm. By the time they had reached a certain point where this letter is written, or this part of Revelation is written to them, 
Maybe they had grown cold. In reading, I, I have this book here that Mikhail brought in tonight to give to you. Um, in reading, this is a, The Mysteries of Revelation. It's a, a book written in French, and I really enjoyed the read on it. There to see it um, today. And some of the stuff I'll share with you later on, I've translated it into English. But in this particular situation, uh, because the city was so wealthy, and there were no physical needs present, well, let me just say this. According to what I've read in this book uh, by the French author, he said that the city of Laodicea was already in existence by the time that John penned these words 40 years. They were in the second generation. So about the time that the Colossian church was planted, Laodicea was also planted. And so by the time he wrote this, the church is in existence for 40 years. They're into the second generation of believers, and they're already becoming lukewarm. They're losing their passion for God. Maybe it was the riches that choked out their passion for God. Maybe it was the fact that they really didn't have to depend upon God. Does that sound familiar at all? Does that sound familiar at all? Why were these lukewarm, what were these uh, lukewarm believers like? They did not oppose Jesus, but they did not draw near to him. Sometimes they attended church, and other times they stayed home. Sometimes they paid tithes, other times they just counted their money. Once in a while they prayed, but most of the time they played. They had a form of godliness, but they lacked the power of God. They were not too bad and not too good. No one accused them of being too spiritual. They were like the dog who sat by the hay. He would not eat the hay, but he prevented the cows from eating it. They were lukewarm. A question I want to ask you, why are lukewarm believers, you know, a problem? Why are lukewarm believers, you know, a problem? Those who are not really in, nor really out. They're just sort of one foot in the world, one foot in the church. Do you know? They give Christians a bad name. Can you speak up in my... I don't they know give Christians a bad name. They give Christianity a bad name? Yeah. Okay. They cause other people not to want to go forward as well. So they become a way preventing other people from moving forward. Yes, Sister Judy? They don't do anything. They just stay that way because they're complacent. Okay, complacent. All right. Yeah. So in this situation here, what we have is a church that's lukewarm. And then we have the second. The second condition here is they were full of confidence in themselves. In Revelation 17, first part, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Now remember, as John is being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words, this, this, this particular church, we see the correlation with the historical uh, city itself, with Laodicea, the reality of what they... They did not need the Romans to help them. We are wealthy enough. We don't need any assistance. We're going to rebuild our city. And they did it on, on at least two occasions that we're aware of. They rebuilt the city with their own funds, with their own money, because they were wealthy. In this particular situation, he's saying the Christian, the church, was so confident in itself that they didn't need anyone. They didn't need anyone. We might have some examples today that we could list. I don't, I'm not here to smack or slam on anybody. The lukewarm feel no need for God because they're comfortable. Everything's going good. They feel no appetite for spiritual things. They do not hunger and thirst after righteousness. They are simply saying, I'm good. I'm good. I feel good about what I'm doing. Lukewarm believers are a great stumbling block, that's what we just mentioned here, to the lost, to those outside, and even to those within the church. A great stumbling block. 
We could call these Sunday morning hypocrites pretending to love Jesus, and yet their lives are lived for themselves. Jesus loves the lost whom the lukewarm discourage from coming to him. As believers, we must guard against being lukewarm. What is the key? The water in the Odyssey was hot at its source. The further it got from its source, the cooler it became. And when it mixed with the cold water of Colossus, it, it was definitely not suitable for quenching thirst. It was suitable for sustaining simply a modicum of life. Christians stay near the source, need to stay near the source of their spiritual life. And who is that? That's Jesus Christ. They need to stay close to the source. So, if someone is lukewarm, the solution, move closer to Jesus. It's like you take a coal in the midst of the fire that's burning orange and yellow, and you take it out and set it to the side, it becomes black and empty of light. Maybe just a few embers still show. But if left by itself for a period of time, it will die out and will no longer be hot. You take that same coal and put it back in the fire, it will begin to glow again. And so we as Christians, we need to be able to ask the Lord to help us to stay close to Jesus. It's interesting that Peter, when he, uh, when Jesus was taken in the Garden of Gethsemane, he followed from a distance, whereas John stayed close the whole time. And the question is, and we know that, that Peter had been prophesied by Jesus that he would deny three times. It's just the idea of, of relationship. Our relationship with the Lord. The further we are away from Him, the colder our relationship with Him becomes. And thus, we become, as it were, lukewarm if we continue to foster that distance between us and the Lord. Feeling satisfied. I have all I ever want. And that's the reason why Jesus said it is hard for a rich man to enter through the eye of a needle. Now, there are a lot of interpretations for what that eye of the needle Jesus was talking about. Some say it was a very small gate that that camels had very difficult time getting through. Others say it was an actual needle. And Jesus and his disciples said, who can be saved? Who can be saved? And so we get the idea that wealth can have a tendency of drawing our hearts away from the Lord. I have known uh, people that were not wealthy, love the Lord, and in the blessing of God, they became wealthy and somewhere along the line forgot the source of their blessing and walked away from the Lord, embracing things that are not eternal. The next condition is they were unaware. They were unaware of how Jesus saw them. The second half of verse 17, and do not know that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now they said, they were saying of themselves, because you say I am rich, because I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And this particular thing here, these lukewarm believers boasted that they had everything. But Jesus said they were shameful, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It'd be interesting to see what people would do today if their pastor talked to them like that. But this is the Lord and Savior that they say they follow. Speaking to a church which could definitely be applied to what we see often in churches in wealthier countries in the world. These believers had lots of money, but were poor spiritually. They could go out and buy the latest things that their society was offering at the time because they had the money to do it. People can go out and buy the latest things. But the question is, where are they in their relationship with the Lord? Their city was famous for the garments it wove, the black uh, linen that they wove. But they were spiritually naked. 
They were lacking, they were wanting. Laodicea was well known for the eye medicine it made, but these believers were blind. They were walking around in spiritual blindness. Others do not always see us as we see ourselves. An old proverb says, when a person tells his own story, he always makes a hero of himself. <laughs> oh, look! You know, it's interesting that, that uh, Paul commended not the church at Laodicea for its giving to the needs of the Christians in Jerusalem. It was the church at Phili uh, Philippi, the Philippians, that he commended that in your need you have given. And because you have given in your need, I will brought a blessing upon you. You see, like Jesus rebuked, or not rebuked, but he shared with his disciples, you see these Pharisees and these Sadducees coming in with great sacks of coins of gold and silver and dropping them in the temple treasure. They give out of their abundance, but this woman who gave two pennies gave out of her necessity, out of her need, all that she had. And the question should be asked, who loved God more, the Pharisees or this woman who gave everything that she had? The same can be asked today, are we giving the Lord our life, are we living for Him? It is the Lord's opinion of us that really matters. It's not what other people say. It's not going to give me a slap on the back. Hey, you're a great person. You're a good person. God's word is like a mirror. And as we read God's word, as we stay close to him, uh, according to the epistle of James, that word that's like a mirror will reflect back who we truly are. Who we truly are. And what he does, he invites us to look at ourselves in it. To truly look at ourselves through his word then we can judge ourselves by His standards and not our own. So I'm a pretty good joke. But if we look at the mirror of God's Word, uh, we don't look so pretty. Have you ever seen the before and after pictures of a drug addict who's been set free from, from drugs? I mean, serious addiction. Those are on meth and their, their bodies are they're, they're shriveled up, they're thin. And, and then you see them a year later, after having been cleaned and dried and born again and saved by the grace of God, and you can't hardly tell it's the same person. A lot of people who think they look like the person a year later are really like the person that is still under the influence and the addiction. The addiction to their own ways, their own desires. God, come along and bless me, bless what I'm doing. And they don't see that they're poor, wretched, miserable, naked, blind. And God help us. The Bible says there will be many that will say in that day, Lord, Lord. And the Lord will say to them, I have never knew, I have never known you. It's not the fact that people show up at church and drop the check in the offering plate. It is the fact that they are walking with the Lord. Do they have a testimony? There was a funeral that I was part of since I've been here where the mother was really concerned for the daughter that had died. But the son and of this woman uh, was assured, assured me that she had accepted Jesus Christ. When they offered people to testify on her behalf and for her, you know, or give, give good stories, anecdotes, and stuff like that, never once was Jesus mentioned, even by those who she had only known for a couple of years. It was about what a good lady she was, and she was very helpful, she loved people, and, and all that. Someone in the world without Christ can do that, because we're created in the image of God. And if that part of the image of God that is more favorable shines through, they can act good, but it doesn't mean it's going to get them into heaven. Because our goodness is like filthy rags in the presence of a three times holy God. <clears throat> Every time holiness is mentioned, it's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Our goodness does not pave the way for us. Unfortunately, that, that is the 
the reality. The Holy Spirit searches our hearts and minds. So we have a choice. Are we going to get closer to the source or are we going to get further away? Sometimes God and His grace and mercy will take away everything we're leaning on in this world in order to draw us back to Himself. I'd rather die a pauper than to die a rich man and go to hell. Die a pauper and go to heaven than to die a rich man and go to hell. Amen. And so it doesn't mean that riches and wealth are, are something that that we shouldn't serve or that we that, that that is evil in itself. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And if God blesses us with financial blessing, we should look at how we can be a blessing to the kingdom of God with those resources. Instead of consuming and buying more quads, buying more this, buying more that, buying bigger houses, buying bigger barns, because the blessings are so great. Amen. But the rich man in Lazarus in the Lazarus parable did not know that he was destitute, even though he was wealthy. And the fourth, the, fourth thing, the fourth thing here, the condition, was they were in danger of losing their salvation. We see in Hebrews, this is not directly mentioned here, but it is alluded to. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? How shall we escape? Now, there are people who I respect, but I don't agree with everything they say. My Baptist friends will say, once saved, you're always saved. You can live like hell and still go to heaven. And I don't agree with that. They say repentance is not repentance from sin, but repentance from unbelief, which is part of it. But there's repentance also from sin. And Paul mentions too much in his readings. And Christ himself, if you obey me and keep my commandments, then you are my child. You are one of mine. There's too much in the scriptures that help us know that salvation is not something that is guaranteed. You see, we find this in the five, five of the seven churches where this was a real danger. Jesus warned Ephesus that he would take away their lampstand if believers did not repent. He warned Pergamum or Pergamos that he would fight against them with the sword of his mouth if they did not change, requiring repentance. He warned Thyatira of harsh suffering if they did not stop following Jezebel. He warned Sardis that he would come like a thief and judge them in, uh, if they did not wake up. A church that was asleep, and here at Laodicea, that he would spit them out of his mouth if they did not repent. Very harsh words. Sometimes in our churches today, we are afraid of harsh words because people will leave and go to the church down the street where the words aren't so harsh. Itching ears. To hear what they want to hear. But not drawing close to the Lord. Not drawing close to the Lord. The believers of John's day lived in great spiritual danger. Without it, repentance, many would lose their relationship with Christ. Our enemy Satan prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. He's not concerned about those who are in the world. His only concern is to keep you from them. To keep you from them. Uh, yeah, he enslaves them in sin and all that stuff, but he doesn't want you going to him. Because you offer the words of life, the words of hope through Christ's gospel. So he's probably around, he's looking. Like what happened with the friend that uh, Mikhail was mentioning. We let, the, we let it down and Satan begins to lie to us, saying that really deceiving individuals into believing that they're hearing the Spirit of God Other situations where a person is, uh, how can it be wrong when it feels so right? How can it be wrong? How could God, I am happy again. It's all about my happiness and not about my holiness. You understand what I'm saying? Then we have the invitation, the second major part, is the invitation of Christ. 
there's three things in the invitation of Jesus. Number one, he invited them to repent. Those whom I loved, I rebuke and discipline. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. The word in uh, the New King James Version is zealous. Others use the word eager. In other words, be eager to repent. Jesus was very direct. Why? Because it was a question of heaven and hell. Do you have a comment? You're good? No, I just saw your hand up there. I just wanted to make sure. Jesus was very direct. He did not circle around the mountain. He didn't go around the bush. He went right for the heart of the matter. He had no praise for the church at Laodicea, only a sharp rebuke. But his rebuke came from a heart of love. You see, he wanted them to recognize their true condition so that they could work on that. It wasn't their money that was going to save them. It's interesting, I heard a joke last night, and uh, uh, our friends came and visited us that are living in Livermore. The, the French couple that came in sang and ministered here shared this joke last night about uh, was it him? I think it was him or was it his wife? I can't remember. Either one about this man who told his wife before he died, I want all my money to be buried with me. And so he made her promise. Huh? He made her promise. And she promised that she would do it. And so what did she do? She One of the friends that heard about it gets up to the casket, looks in, and he looks at his wife and says, where's all the money? And uh, she says, it's, in a, it's on a check in his pocket. <laughs> you see, a lot of people think that they can take it with them, and they can't. But the riches that come from a relationship with Jesus Christ last for an eternity. And that's the thing that is so important. That is what's so important. Some people think that if you, if there's correction and discipline, that that can't be true love. Some parents think, well, I'm never going to discipline my child. I'm never going to spank them. I'm never going to do this. I'm just going to let them do whatever they want to do. And what they're doing is raising a future criminal. A, a, a person who is disrespectful, who doesn't respect authority of any sort or nature. God in his love for us also disciplines us and corrects us. He calls them to repent, to acknowledge that they are in need. And if I could say it this way, God uses tears of repentance to cleanse our souls. He uses tears of repentance to cleanse our soul. Blessed are those that who mourn, for they will be comforted. Another thing that is so true is that we need to welcome a wound of a friend more than a kiss from an enemy. A friend yeah. will tell you the truth in love. I had that situation where I was talking, I was upset about a situation, I was talking with fellow missionaries, and the missionary that was there, that was part of our field in Haiti, he looked at me and he said, Stephen, that's the wrong attitude. Oh. At first, my hackles started to raise, and then I realized that he was absolutely right. And I apologized on the spot. And my dad would tell me, oh, I always hated it. Watch your attitude, Stephen. I didn't like to hear that. Watch your attitude, Stephen. And you know what? If we love someone and we see them doing something that they shouldn't be doing, we need to tell them the truth of the word. Now, their response is up to them. But if we do it in the spirit of love, we've done, we have discharged our responsibility, and then they have to make the choice. And then they are responsible for what comes. They're responsible anyhow, but they have been duly warned or duly uh, talked to. The second here is he invited them. He invited them to repent, Revelation 3, 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Therefore be zealous and repent. Excuse me, you know what? I got, I got this behind here a little bit. I got a little confused. I wanted to invert from the notes that I got, number one and number two. 
He invited them to get everything they needed from him. So, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see, that you may see. You see, he offered them a solution to their problem, to their situation. He didn't leave them hanging. He invites us to trust in him instead of ourselves. Instead of ourselves. You know, it's interesting, as I was reading through the, the French book, what did Jesus say to them? You are poor, despite your banks and wealth. You are blind, despite your school of ophthalmology and your eye medication. You are naked, despite your black wool industry. He was using the natural things to create it, to communicate a, a, a spiritual truth here. You have it all, but you have nothing. You have it all materially, but spiritually, you are lacking. And so he invited them to buy from him gold, refined in the fire. Peter talks about the refining fire that refines our faith and draws us closer to him. Sometimes God will use circumstances in our lives that are hard to deal with, but if we do not lose hope and do not lose faith, we will be refined, and what happens in that refining, the dross is pulled away, and we become more like Jesus every single day. Bad times come, circumstances come, we don't understand, we wonder why, but if we hold fast to Christ, we refine him. So he's telling him, hey, you got the gold in your bank, Account. You got the silver, but buy for me gold refined in the fire. Buy for me a faith that is strong and unshakable, and that is of far greater value than any bank account you could have anywhere. He also says here, in this particular situation, he says, he says, and white garments that you may be clothed. Now they had the black wool that was. Uh, that was coveted by many people all over the Roman Empire, and they shipped it everywhere. But there's something better than the comfort of the black wool. There's that white garment, that robe of righteousness that will cover our spiritual nakedness as we draw closer to the Lord, as we draw closer to Him. Each person must choose between trusting in himself and receiving Jesus as Savior. Why? Because in Him, we are complete. It's interesting, you are in Christ Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. You are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's not the latest fad, it's not the latest car, it's not the latest gadget. It was interesting. From time to time on YouTube, I, I follow a lot of the you know different things with the police and stuff like that, police interaction with the public and or situations, you know, active self-defense and stuff like that. And they show videos of people getting attacked. This guy walks out of a shop in one of the cities, um, and he's got a Rolex, a Rolex on his arm. And they just show the slow motion of him getting tackled, it's a surveillance camera, getting tackled by two thugs in broad daylight, and they're just beating on them until they knock him unconscious and they take his Rolex and run off with it. Who knows what that Rolex meant to him as a, as a status symbol in his life. I had the money to purchase a Rolex. Now Cynthia and I, we went downtown Brussels where they had this under, uh, it was like a lighted uh, covering between street. It was a street where you could go. And we saw purses being sold for $49,000. I'm like, what? Pairs of gloves for a thousand. You know, I'm like, this is nuts. I wasn't even drooling, folks. I wasn't drooling. Watches. Oh my. 
studded with diamonds all the way around and on the arms, you know. I mean, I, I, I can't even see how they could pass each other when they're showing the time because the diamonds were so big. Like, this is crazy. Things were so expensive. I remember one time showing up in, in Monaco, which is which is a city state between France and Italy. And I'm there with my family, we just went to visit, and I show up at, at, at we're passing down the street, we're just walking around because it's such a small city, and there's a Ferrari dealership. Oh, and I was thinking, wow, let's go in, let's go and look at the in the parking lot. We dared not enter the doors, but we wanted to go to the parking lot. And there are I was standing between a silver Ferrari on one side. I wish I could say it was candy apple red, but it wasn't. It was a silver Ferrari on one side, and then we had a Lamborghini, silver Lamborghini on the other. <laughs> and I was pointing at it. And I wanted to send it to speed the light and say, which one do I choose? <laughs> God's called me to minister to the wealthy in Monaco. <laughs> I didn't send it. It was just a joke. But the thing is, there's, there's a lot of, people can possess things. They can have a yacht that sails the Mediterranean, and they, they fly over there three times a year to spend a week or two on the Mediterranean. But if they're not right with God, and they're not in relationship with the Lord, it matters a lot. I've seen yachts that cost 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. In Nice, you go to the beach, or can you go to the, to the, to the docks, and you see these, I mean, you almost think that they have gold-plated faucets type of thing. And you're looking at these things, you're just like, what? Full-time captains, they would pay, that that's their job. And they may only go out four or five times a year. But the rest of the time, they're making sure that that yacht stays spick and span and clean and well-serviced so that whenever they're, the owner wants to get in and take off, it's ready to roll. What shall profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? These are not trite words. He invites them to get everything they need from him. And then the second one, he invites them to repent. And then he invited them to open the door and let him in. Behold, I stand at the door knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him. You, many of you have seen the famous photo of Jesus standing outside the door, knocking on it. But there is no doorknob on the outside. And this is the thing that we must remember. That he is on the outside, but we have to invite him in. We have to invite him in. How does Jesus knock on the door? He knocks through the Holy Spirit in church services. He knocks through his word. He knocks through the witness of believers. He knocks through the beauty of of his creation and the soft wind that blows. He knocks through the building that people know is his house. He knocks through the songs that believers sing. He knocks when a baby is born into a home. He knocks when a loved one dies. He knocks through every blessing he sends. He knocks through his goodness and kindness. Do you hear him when he knocks? Do I hear him when he knocks? A church is made up of people. Each person in the church must respond to Christ. And you've heard the old saying, God has no grandchildren. You cannot depend on the salvation of your parents to get you to heaven. You have to depend on Him. And then the last thing, and we'll open it up for a couple questions here if you have any. Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. The promise of eternity in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, doing and accomplishing his purposes and plans for eternity. Brother, Brother K. Part, there will be a day whether you, you go with the trumpet that blows or the Lord takes you through the, 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 the doorway of death. But when you open up your eyes, you're going to see Jesus face to face, and you'll no, no longer have a body that's weak and, and, and struggling just to get around. I won't have an elbow that's killing me. I won't have this. I won't have that. I won't have to struggle with my blood sugar. I don't have to do anything. Why? Because we are going to be completely healthy. And you know what? I've seen some pictures of you when you were younger. Good looking guy. 
I've seen some pictures of when you were younger. And you know what? That's what you're going to be in heaven. You're not going to be 87 or 86 years old walking around with a cane in your hand. Sister McCree, you're not going to be dealing with hip issues, you know? Pain in those areas. Brother Rick, your back and your neck are going to be completely healed. Brother McCall, you won't be having to stretch out every time because your back is killing you. Sister Cindy, you'll be able to turn your head almost in a full circle. No, I'm <laughs> Since her accident, she's only been able to turn it just a certain degree. You know, Brother Rick, no, Brother Stan's always been healthy. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. All I'm saying, folks, is that there's going to come a time when we're going to be sitting with Him. Amen. If we overcome. Amen. 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 I don't know if you have any questions or comments. We're done with the series on the seven churches of Revelations. And um, I know I didn't give you a whole lot of time, but we can take a little bit more time if you want. It's not like we have to leave here in five minutes. But if there are any questions that you have on any of the churches that we've studied, or particularly this one, or comments, don't hesitate to ask. And I can't promise you I'll have the answer, but I have... Brother Mikael and I Pastor Kate Park that will be able to answer for us. So, Brother Rick, you, you've got your hand that's wanting to go up. Uh, <laughs> well, one of the, the things that, you know, we were discussing uh, some of the uh, causes that can lead to the church being uh, lazy is the effect of the family uh, being lackadaisical and family is that affects generation to generation to generation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, that was part of my problem when I was a younger Christian, where that the Holy Spirit showed me that being lazy, bring my family to church, would affect my family later on. Yeah. And uh, through generation to generation. So yeah. the Holy Spirit corrected that as a young Christian. Right. And, and you know, in this whole situation, with, uh, with this circumstance, is, is the fact that the church also needs to do its job in helping parents know how to raise godly children. And a generation, especially for those who, are, who became Christians as adults and were raised maybe in unsaved families where they didn't know, they didn't have a Christian upbringing. And all of a sudden, they come to Christ as an 18, 19, 20 year old or a young adult and they get married to someone in the church who may have come from a mixed background themselves. And all of a sudden, they have a little baby Johnny in their hands. And they're like, how in the world am I supposed to raise this child to love God? And the church has a, an important role to play in making it and teaching the parents how to raise godly children in the day and age in which we live. And that's, that's one of our responsibilities as a church. It's part of our discipling. Discipling parents on how to disciple their children so that when their children come of age, they can make that choice themselves. I want to follow Christ. And that's where that close walk with the Lord comes in, is that the Holy Spirit walks with you and guides you and directs your path through these situations. Right. You know, and that's that, that's that's one of the things that we need to do. Any other any other comments or questions? You know, sometimes I don't realize. I mean, I, I just look back even at the community and the church had very similar values. And the church really taught you to love the Lord. But a lot of times they didn't have a lot of teaching on how to raise your kids. Yeah. And I know I came from a home that was not a Christian home. Therefore, I just thank the Lord that my kids serve the Lord today. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because I, it was a learning process and it was a right. hard learning process. And, uh, but I, I have admired um, so many good teachers that have come on, on the scene through the years now mm -hmm. that have helped, helped that in that respect. But I just think there's such a danger today, especially, that, you know, it's kind of like that story about the frog. You know, you put the frog in cold water and you turn on heat and you yep. never realize it's not. Exactly. I think the church a lot. That's how I think we look at this Laodicea in church as a vacuum. We have sat and let the pot begin to boil and 
nuts. Yeah. I don't, I'm not an activist, but nevertheless, we, and that's probably the problem. You know what, I, I think part of the problem that we face, Sister McCree, is not the fact that we're living in a time that is becoming more and more decadent, more and more evil. No. The, the, the issue is, is that the church, or the believers that make up the body of Christ, or are part of the church, have uh, have laid aside yes. or have discharged themselves of the responsibility yeah. of being act living actively their faith in the world around them. Yeah. You know, there were communities. What would Jesus do? Was became very popular yes. and faddish about 15 years ago. People had bracelets and all that stuff. But the book, in his steps, if you've ever read it, you would see that. The revival in the church became a spiritual awakening in the community. And bars were shut down. Places of ill repute were shut down. And they have communities in Latin America where the church has become so strong that the police have hardly anything to do. And they only have, you know, the, 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 the one holdout there like drunk that... You know, walking down the street that they'll take them in and let them dry out, you know, type of thing. They, because there's been a transformation in the community, and that's because the Christians were living their life, and that's happening even today in places throughout the world. But the challenge that we face as American Christian, American Christians or European, I can say that I believe for Europe, uh, not all of Europe, but parts of Europe, the problem is, is that we're comfortable. That's right. What is the enemy trying to do? He's trying to get us lulled into a comfortable way of living, whether we have a lot of money or not, but our needs are met. So if our needs are met, why do I need God? Why do I need God? Thank and you. We, that, that, was what my, that, was, that was where I was going. I thought you did it so much better than I could have done. But that was what I was saying. The thing about it is, we might have our, our physical needs, but our spiritual needs are still wanting. Well, just like just like I said, we could be physically looking really great and beautiful and handsome, and and everything's going great. But th then, that's how we look on the outside. But if we were to look at our spiritual person or man, or woman, we would see like that druggie that's just all swollen or not swollen, but sunken in because of the drugs and the sin in their life, or the spirit of man is so weak. So in this particular situation, um, it's all the churches, Ephesus left their first love. Pergamos per allowed uh, people to come in and to teach things were, that were against God and allowed permitted immorality. Sardis, the same thing. Uh, Thyatira. You know, all these churches that had things that were going on inside of them, there were those who were faithful within those churches. I just pray for American Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that in the days ahead, because oftentimes in his love for us, he allows persecution to come to refocus us back to the important and essential things. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but it could happen. And sometimes in individual lives. See, we don't like to say that God judges people. God's not me. My God doesn't. My God doesn't do that. Well, yeah, your God, according to your own understanding, your own making, yeah, he wouldn't do that. But the God of the Bible, because he loves us, he disciplines us. Because he loves us, he corrects us. Those are things that we have to, have to realize and understand. And you show the season. They say things are no worse today than they were in the Old Testament many times. But he gave us a new way to do it in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and his mercy, the invitation of Christ given to the Laodicean church was that, hey, come back to me. Buy those things which are truly of value. Put on some spiritual eye salve and have your blindness so that you can see clearly spiritually speaking. And it's not just all about, you know, whatever. Get Put on the robe of righteousness instead of a robe that, you know, everybody say, ooh, wow, look at that. 
look at them, they're dressed this way, they're, is that Laodicean wool, you know, type of thing? We can get so caught up in worldly things, and we just need to ask God for His grace and for His mercy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's close with the word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for your word tonight, and I ask that you would help us, Father God, as we move forward, that you would help us to, Father, draw close to the source. We don't want to be lukewarm. We don't want to be tepid where you spit us out of your mouth. We want to be hot or refreshing, cold, refreshing. There's a, it's not a contra saying one or the other is bad, but it's saying that it either be one or the other, but don't be lukewarm. Be refreshing and be hot. As Christians, you do your work in our lives, and I just pray, God, that you help us to keep our focus on you, draw close to the source, draw close to you, and there, Father God, we will be able to receive from you all that you have for us, and we can have an impact in the world around us. Lord, one last time I pray your blessing upon the First Assembly of God, and ask that your spirit would guide and direct them into the future that you have for them, a future that is filled, Lord God, with the power of your spirit, because your people are walking in and in with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If we have a second